Welcome to Koi's Corner, a channel for personal and spiritual growth. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to like, subscribe, and leave me a comment letting me know why. Greetings, my name is Rashida, or Koi, and over 15% of the world follows the religion known as Hinduism. That's roughly 1.1 billion people as it stands right now. And although to many Hinduism, because of all its differences, might seem confusing, there is a way that we can come to understand it, find a sect for us, and practice it every single day to help us awaken and liberate ourselves. So what can we do on a daily basis to practice Hinduism and help us grow, not just spiritually, but in the material realm that we live in right now as well? Well, the first thing one must do is understand the core values of Hinduism. After all, we can't follow a religion or, or spiritual practice if we don't understand what its values are and why we are following it at all. And for, for the complete depth on what these aspects of Hinduism are, I did a full video that you can click above about the religion itself, but these are the simplified terms. First, we have to understand the four permissibles or acceptable ways of practicing and living in this incarnation. These are known as the Purusharthas. First, there is Dharma or righteous and pure living, which means really just discovering our path in life and fulfilling it fully and righteously with virtue in mind. Secondly, there is Artha or the acceptance of attainment of wealth and prosperity for you and your family members or for your just yourself. It's okay to want to have a good job, to take care of yourself and to take care of others and buy nice things to enjoy your life and live comfortably, so long as you're doing so compassionately and lovingly, all the while helping others. After this, we have Kama or enjoyment of sensory desires, again, so long as they are done in a compassionate or pure way as much as we can. This includes sensory sensual activity, this includes the arts, anything that has to do with enjoying this physical body is okay as long as we do it righteously. And of course, moksha, or liberation from the temporal self unto realizing its true nature as the eternal self. This is the overall goal of Hindu practice in daily life. If we don't hold these beliefs and understandings about ourself and what we're doing and our practice every single day, it's just going to be impossible to live and practice what's to follow. Along these lines, we also need to understand the nine core beliefs of Hinduism. Because while the four permissibles allow us to understand the physical activities and, and the actions we do physically and mentally, the nine core beliefs beliefs of Hinduism are what will represent and frame our mind mentally, consciously, and our soul to help us see what this practice really is and why it's so powerful. And the nine core beliefs are that one, Hindus believe in one all-pervasive supreme being who is either imminent and transcendent, both the creator and the unmanifested reality. This is Brahman, allness as totality, as one, as us and that and separateness as an illusion. Two is that Hindus believe in the divinity of the four Vedas. Again, the Vedas are the foundation and rock bottom of what Hinduism is. All practices of Hinduism and Vedanta and all these schools deal with the teachings of the Vedas and the Upanishads. These few texts are what comprise the Sanatana Dharma, the eternal truth as Hinduism was originally known to be. Third, Hindus believe that the universe undergoes an endless cycle of creation, preservation, and dissolution. Again, creation being Brahma, preservation being Vishnu, and dissolution being Shiva, represented by these gods. Four, Hindus believe in karma, the law of cause and effect by which individuals create their own destiny through our thoughts, words, and actions. Karma is the actions of our life. What we are causing has a reaction, and that causality is what we experience. It's just how it goes, and we accept that as truth in Hinduism. Fifth, Hindus believe that the soul reincarnates, evolving through many births until all the karmas have been resolved. This is what it means to attain liberation. We continue cycling through births, getting the experiences we need in these manifested limited planes until we can come to realize and transcend this limited nature and attain moksha by where we return to oneness and these reincarnations, these cycles of self, trying to get that we're all of it and really know it end. Sixth, Hindus believe that divine beings exist in unseen worlds and that temple worship rituals and sacraments create a communion between the deity. Seven, Hindus believe that enlightened masters or gurus, sometimes known as sat gurus, are essential to understand the transcendental absolute. This is because while we think in the West with our ego that I can understand it by myself, that I can awaken by myself, that I can practice Hinduism on my own, it's 
an illusion. It really does help to have teachers. By having these teachers, they all allow us to awaken to things that we might have never even perceived before, so it's important to find a teacher. Eight, Hindus believe that all life is sacred to be loved and revered, and also practice ahimsa, or non-violence, as best we can. And nine, Hindus believe that no religion teaches the only way to salvation. And this is a big one. Basically, you can practice Hindu philosophy while also being a Jew, while also being a Christian, while also being a Muslim. They are all possible because all paths are just paths to oneness if done purely. And once we have all of this down, we can move into finding a path to practice every day, really what entails Hinduism completely, which is one of the four paths to liberation. They are Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, and Raja Yoga. Again, for more details, please watch my full video on Hinduism up here. And finding this path in which to practice every day really comes down to your Dharma, your truth, your path coming and making itself known. Sort of trusting your intuition to see which one works for you. But it's something we practice again every day. This is called our sadhana, our daily spiritual practice, especially in Hinduism. And once we have this path figured out, we want to think about the small things in life we can use to practice because this is a long-term thing, right? Practicing bhakti, karma, jnana, yoga, they're all long-term lifelong things. But what we do every day on the small scale really comprises a lot of it. One of those things is known as puja or worship. What this means is to have a puja table, which I will show mine for a second right here. Now everyone's puja table can be different. There are classical ways in which they should look, which you can see on Google, but it really comes down to what you want to do and what puja practice you want to take up. This again, taking your own research to decide what works for you. My puja practice is a tantra puja practice, which you can find in my morning routine video up here. Others will look completely different, but what worship really means is to sit with the presence and, and the truth that these teachers and these deities convey, that they represent, and truly be one with that. Surrender yourself to that and let that wash over you. Thank them for their service. Light a candle to represent their eternal light. Giving yourself fully to them and thanking them for helping you create everything that you are. We are really sitting with the presence of their wisdom and trying to embody it fully within our own heart and be with it truthfully. Keeping our own self out of the equation and giving ourselves to this worship. This is us surrendering and serving God or the universe or our teachers before we do anything else in the day. And usually puja is done in the early morning, but can also be done in the evening. It depends on your schedule and which you prefer. This is basically our one-on-one -on -one time with the universe, really getting to down to the core of this practice and of awakening through the wisdom that has been shown to us through these Ishvaras, these personal manifestations of the universe or through our own teachers. And after this, we move on to the next big practice of Hinduism that is really kind of required in a lot of schools, meditation, gosh, meditation. Please practice meditation. If you want to check out my book on meditation, it will be down below. But there are many meditation videos on YouTube that have to do with mantra meditations, japa meditations, basic insight meditations, to sit with allness and truly fall out of mind and just being with the reality in which we are. That's a transcendental experience that makes everything else in Hinduism far easier to practice. And this is why it's shown in Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, all of them practice meditation. And on top of this, the hardest thing we do in daily life and how to practice Hinduism, we have to change our diet. As we just talked about in the core beliefs on Hinduism, all beings are equal. So we have to practice nonviolence or ahimsa as best we can. What does this mean? Eating the most compassionate diet we can. What is the most compassionate diet? In truth, it is veganism, but if you are raising your own livestock, if you are being compassionate to the animals, you can also practice vegetarian living, which is why virtually all of India, almost a billion people are vegetarian. It's not just that some Hindus think it's right to be a vegetarian and to respect all animals. It's that virtually all of them take this as a core part of the practice to becoming a Hindu and practicing Hinduism. So it's really just in a lot of ways hypocritical to practice Hinduism in, in any school of thought, whether it be a Vedanta, an Advaitic view, or an Advaitic view, without practicing a vegetarian diet without trying to cause as least suffering as you can and really practicing nonviolence with what you put in your body. And finally, we step back to some of the restraints we want to show in our daily actions after we do puja, after we meditate, after we pick up this progressive diet. Once we understand which path we are following, we want to also practice these 10 niyamas or observances, which include modesty, contentment, charity, faith, worship of the Lord in whatever form you choose, scriptural listening, cognition, vows, 
incantations and austerity above all. By really taking these in and embodying them as often as you can, you are practicing Hinduism at its core level. Now, of course, if you want to get more philosophical, we can practice the Yoga Sutras, the Eight Limbs, but what it really comes down to is, again, understanding these conscious things, these intellectual things, the four permissible actions, the nine core beliefs, the observances we should have, and after we do all this, well, it just means finding which path works for you. Which path of liberation do you choose? Do you want to be a bhakta? Do you want to be a karma yogi? Do you want to be a yana yogi, a raja yogi? Do you want to mix them together and see what works? That is all you really need to get on the path and take in all this extra information, which probably seems like a lot right now, to allow you to practice Hinduism. It is the most life-changing practice that I've ever had in my life, the practice of Vedanta and Hinduism, which I will be doing more videos on soon. I really hope that the practice of Hinduism is something you plan to take up. If so, remember to go to temples as well. Find a teacher, find places to practice and worship, find a community. It will help you grow stronger and stronger in a much quicker way. If you have any questions or comments on this video, please make sure to like, subscribe, and leave your comments below. I will do my best to answer what I can. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Ram Ram.